Here's my little stretch, spiritual stretching homework. You are praising the Lord, you opened up some space. You're sitting quietly, speak to your servants listening. You don't have to claim to be a prophet sent from God to say, thus saith the Lord. But in your best sense, what was Jesus saying to you? To share it with the person next to you, okay? What, you don't have to be right, I'm not turning you into the Pope, okay? In your best sense, what was the Lord saying to you? Go with that. All right, uh, my word was make you go through that exercise. <laughs> it was. It was. I, I didn't have that plan to do tonight. But as I was praying, the Lord is like, uh, my sense was, the Lord was saying, stretch my people, right? Stretch my people. Uh, get them to learn, get them to exercise that spiritual muscle of a faith expectancy that the living God is here. He knows you, sees you, loves you, and is speaking to your heart in a way that you can understand and communicate. Uh, that's a, it's really the essence of, the, of our life of faith. Tonight we're going to take a look at how God has historically renewed his church. And we're going to focus in on this theme of movements, of movements. The idea of being moved by the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit moves people in different ages. And is he doing that today among us? Hmm. So Carrie and I, it was like in night, it was about the year 2002. Uh, we had a couple of kids at the time living in Federal Way, Washington, in a, in a small house. And uh, at that point, um, I was not only leading a ministry and doing other kind of consulting work, I was trying to finish my doctoral dissertation. And it meant a lot of days sitting in um, the one extra room we had, looking out the window and typing away. Do you remember those days, dear? Yeah. I still have notes where I'll wake up going, <gasps> Oh, my dissertation's done. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. But uh, at the time, that was a real thing, by the way. So um, I would sit and I would look out the window and try to focus and say, okay, I've got to type some more. I've got to finish more, type this, this long paper. And I would look out at my neighbor's yard, which was perfect. And then I looked at our yard, which was not perfect. And, um, and so one day I was typing away and, and all of a sudden I heard the lawnmower, my neighbor, and I look up and he's mowing my lawn. <laughs> mowing my lawn. Because I didn't do a very good job with the lawn and he did such an amazing job with his yard. I was like, what is he doing? So I go outside and he stops the lawnmower and I'm like, what are you doing? And he said, God told me, <laughs> God told me to mow your lawn. I was stunned. And what I said in reply was, did he mention the laundry? <laughs> he did not mention the laundry. But I'm like, are you serious? This guy was charismatic. He, he was a Pentecostal, he wasn't Catholic. He would have prayer meetings in his garage with, with, his, with his son. They'd be praising the Lord, the big, whooping it up. And um, so very open to the Spirit, open to the Spirit. Holy Spirit moved him to mow my lawn because he knew all the things that we were involved in. Two months later, he died. Oh. I'm not connecting those two points. Okay. So, and he came back from the dead. He went into St. Francis Hospital in Federal Way for an ordinary procedure. Things went sideways, bad, worse. Died on the operating table. They kept him alive for an hour and 45 minutes manually keeping his heart going, and he came back. Oh, wow. wow. But they called his time of death. 
They called his time to death, and they just kept beating the heart, beating, kept the heart going, kept the heart going. And for I, I, who, an hour, an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes, and he came back and had a story to tell about going to heaven, meeting Jesus, and oh my goodness, the, the rest of this guy's life, and he still does it today, he travels around the country telling the story of what he saw in heaven. And, and here's the thing, he, um, he just can't wait to die. <laughs> Having, like, it's so incredible in heaven and Jesus and how bright he was and, and he received a new name in heaven. The name he received was Go Back. <laughs> because he's like, I want to stay. And Jesus said, Go Back. And he said, No, I don't, I don't want to leave. You know, and his wife wasn't happy about that part, but uh, Go Back. And the third one, Go Back, he forcefully came back into his body. And he said, he says like he was driving um, with his wife and the wife said, look at the incredible, beautiful, it was like at the time when the flowers were in full bloom, like the most beautiful thing you can see. And he looked at it and he said, I can't believe how dull those colors are compared to heaven, right? Compared to heaven. So uh, what I'm recommending to you is if you want to have a heavenly encounter with Jesus, I have a lot of grass, <laughs> yard work, Lots of opportunities to encounter the Lord. Just open to the Spirit, okay? Be open to the Spirit. Um, but I, seriously, folks, uh, this is all about what we're doing here, becoming open to be moved by the Spirit. This isn't just about movements in some kind of big, grandiose way, because I'm going to talk about big, grandiose, sweeping things that have touched the history of the church about every 500 years. You're gonna hear about blesseds and popes and others, but what this all comes down to is you and you and you and you and me discerning and following the Holy Spirit in our lives, right? Why are we here? Why are we here? We're here because, remember the movement of discipleship, right? There's three moments. There's the moment of the call, the vocation where the Lord has called you into being and he holds you in love because you're unique, one of a kind. God's planted you in this moment in history. But that moment of call then leads to the moment of powerlessness. Remember that, right? Praiseworthy desperation. When we're, I got nothing. I got nothing. But Lord, I just, I, I, I want to fulfill your call, but I'm only going to fulfill the call when that third moment comes, which is the moment of empowerment. Empowerment. And we talked about that last week. Remember that too muchness of God? How many of you experience the too muchness of God? See, Philip Mary, relent, back off. You're too much. Right? So whether we're praying, Jesus, who am I to you? Whether we're that prayer of groaning, Jesus, please, you take over. Or whether we're praying in the shock me with your generosity, O oh Lord. This is all about us becoming the saints that live the mission that God has for us right now. So we've all been moved in some way to get here. God has moved in your life, maybe not through the neighbor and the lawnmower, but God has moved in your life to get you to this place, I mean literally tonight. So as we get started, I'm gonna just have you share in small groups, okay? Just share in small groups. One little, it's the word testimony. What's a testimony? A testimony is when you're the witness to something that has happened. And in this instance, you want to be a witness to something that God has done in your life that has moved you. Okay? Something that has moved you. It might have been a retreat you went on, a talk you heard. It might have been a prayer time you had. It might have been a conversation you had. It might have been someone coming up to you on the street. Whatever, whatever that was, I'm not asking for 15 stories. Just one. One moment where you sensed God moving in your life. Okay? And there's a reason why we do this. And I'll tell you the reason why after. So I want you to actually we'll keep it simple and short. Find one person and share one testimony each. Back with a different person than the person you shared with. 
Okay? You've got the story, you know what I'm saying now? Simple homework. One person uh, share and listen to a testimony, brief, about a time when God moved in your life. Go. All right. So, uh, did anybody hear a testimony, a story, that you thought was so cool that everyone else should get to hear it too? So I'm not asking you to share yours. I'm asking you, you heard the testimony and you said, that, one ought, that person ought to share. And just to let you know, the Holy Spirit's going to lead me to pick on people. So <laughs> you either can follow the lead of the Holy Spirit or you can follow my lead. So who heard one that ought to be heard? People talk away, talk away, and now it's have to share. Zip. What is that all about? All right, I'll honor that. I'll honor that. I'll tell you my story. Okay. Um, so uh, my story is about um, a gang fight and gun fight in my house. What? <laughs> How's that for an attention grabber? <laughs> So the same house Carrie and I were living in, we left the house, uh, bought another house, and by the mercy of God, we were able to keep the house that we had left. And so I was going, I became a landlord. And um, the family that moved in had a few kiddos. Mom and dad were maybe having a harder time parenting, especially the 16-year-old girl. And uh, 16-year-old girl was a magnet for a game. And she decided to have a party at the house. Parents were not there. And so there was a gang having a party in our home, uh, our rental home. And, um, and then what does one gang attract? Another gang. <laughs> so this other gang showed up at our house, entered the house, and there proceeded to be a gunfight in our home. Bam, bam, bam. Everybody scrambled. Some of the kids scrambled out the back uh, of the sliding glass door, <coughs> jumped the fence, and then continued to jump other fences of other yards uh, as they were all screaming like ants, right? And they ended up doing damage to several homes' yards along the way. So let's just say I was not the friendliest uh, the, the most popular neighbor at that point, <laughs> since I had rented my home out to someone who was drawing gangs into the neighborhood in gunshots. So I sent Carrie to go talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to own this. So I ended up going to all the homes in the neighborhood, knocking on the door, explaining what had happened that I had a drug deal go bad, <laughs> it would never happen again. Um, and explain, I apologized that that family had to leave. And, and I said, look, is there any damage? I'll fix it and repair it. So I'm knocking on all the doors. And my neighbor, um, who had died and come back, neighbor next to him, I knocked on their door. Guy opened the door. I explained what was going on. And I noticed there was a woman lying on the couch. And her head was wrapped in a cloth. And I, they welcomed me in started chatting, come to find out that they are Christians, believe in the Lord, very faith-filled, and oh, they happen to listen to Catholic radio. <laughs> they listened to my program. <laughs> they knew who I was. Oh my gosh, you're my neighbor. We can't believe this. Come to find out this woman has cancer, and she's not in a good condition. So I'm like, can we pray? Absolutely. So I prayed with them right there for the Lord to bring about healing and um, promised that I'd continue to pray and left. Um, a few years later, um, we were at a Matt Marr concert. You know Matt Marr, Christian musician? And he was in like, I don't know, Bellevue or Issaquah, somewhere up there. And we were a part of helping that event happen. So we were there, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden I hear, Tom Curran, and I look at, and it's this woman. Oh, crazy. And she comes over to me, I'm like, hey, how's it going? And she said, God healed me. Wow. wow. And, wow. and it was an incredible little testimony of how the Lord yes. 
brought about healing. So, any of you that want to pray for healing, expect gang warfare, <laughs> gunshots. God, look what God, look how much God loved that woman. God loved that woman to say, you know what, I gotta get Tom over there. I gotta, I'm gonna bring healing to this woman's life. Somehow or other, I'm gonna get healing into this woman's life. And if it takes gang warfare to do it, I'll do that. Because God can use everything. So some of you might feel like you have gang warfare with all the bullets happening in your home. You know what the Lord's saying? Watch what I can do. Amen. I'm going to bring healing, even miraculous supernatural healing, that goes beyond anything you could imagine. And it only came because of the battle. The battle opened you to receive the healing that I had in store. Look what God is doing, right? And, and I know that some of us are in this room. We are in this room because of gang warfare on the west side, the battle that we were having in our home to get our kids to be ha healthy, happy, and holy. And it was a battle. But look what God has been doing. So everyone has a testimony. I said that there's a, a power to testimony, right? What's the power to testimony? The power to testimony is you can't say that didn't happen. You can say, I don't accept that argument. I don't think that's a correct interpretation. I don't think that uh, that's what Jesus meant. But you can't, I can't say, you know, this woman was healed of cancer. No, she wasn't. She was. <laughs> so there's, there's something that you can't, there's an incontrovertible quality to testimony. There's a power to testimony. And here's the thing. Each of you, the Lord intends to be his witnesses. But we won't be his witnesses until we become signs and wonders in our own lives. So I'm going to do just a very quick look at how the church, God has used movements, not just individual saints, but movements to bring about transformation in the church. Okay, so first 500 years, right, we come out of the apostolic age and all of a sudden we hit the age of the barbarian invasions, right? And things are not looking good. The Roman Empire falls, Augustine, Pope Leo, the end of the, the end of everything collapsing, right? And what does the Lord do? The Lord raises up this guy who says, get me away from everyone, Benedict. Same Benedict. And Benedict ends up being the father of Western monasticism. So the monastic movement, movement, was what the Holy Spirit raised up in that time that would end up being a source of preserving, protecting, and eventually bringing about new flowering of Catholic Christian culture through a time that was referred to as the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. Right? It was the monastic movement that was the preserver of Catholic Christian culture. So let's, let's fly ahead 500 years. And we have now, uh, you know, monasteries are, are everywhere. But now there's another challenge that's happening. We have new sects coming up, S-E-C-T-S. We have new uh, challenges against the Christian faith. We have uh, new ideas that are spreading out there. And the Lord raises up a, a new movement that doesn't come together, but goes out. The mendicants. So we go from the monastics to the mendicants. Who are the mendicant orders? John. Uh, the Dominicans. Whoa, look at that. He's flexing over there. And there was one who was a... The Franciscans. You got it, right. Yeah, he's, he's good. Where did you, you learn that from? Say your wife. The real one. Discern my wife. My wife, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> The Dominicans and the Franciscans, they were mendicants, and, and this was a hard for the people at the time to understand the church because they weren't in monasteries. They were going out into the world, and they were advancing a kind of poverty where they relied entirely on God. It was a movement of the Spirit, a movement of the Spirit that was different than what the Lord was doing before. Okay. Flash forward another 500 years, and we have a time of the Protestant Reformation. But it wasn't just Protestants that were seeking to reform the church. It was Catholics as well. 
So we have the Catholic, it was often called the Counter-Reformation. So the time of reform, you now have what? You have great spiritual uh, leaders, saints, emerging in the Catholic Church who do what? They end up recovering what had been lost in the origins of certain um, religious orders and bringing out a whole new way of living religious life. So you have, in particular, people like St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila, right? You have the Carmelites, but not just the Carmelites, the discounted Carmelites. They were recovering, they were reforming by going back to the origins, and they were bringing about a reform, right? So let's flash forward another 500 years. Here we are today, right? And what's God doing? Well, God's already did the monastic thing. God's done the mendicant thing. God's done the reform thing. Well, what's God doing now? It's a really interesting thing to discern. What is the Lord doing now? Well, to understand what God just might be doing now, we're gonna go backwards a little bit because I'm gonna end up talking about the Catholic charismatic renewal. God is renewing his church, making it new. And when we think of Catholic charismatic renewal, we think of 1967. How many of you know the date 1967? This was a famous retreat uh, from uh, Duquesne uh, University. There were these students, college students, that went on retreat at the Ark and the Dove retreat house, like 25 students and some professors, and they went away to pray and to study, and they were reading a book called The Cross and the Switchblade, and then they ended up on Saturday night, just one at a time, going up into this chapel, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit started to fall on them. And they experienced what's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And they started manifesting, speaking in tongues and words of prophecy and praise. And, and there was this overwhelming experience of being empowered and anointed by the Holy Spirit. That's what we think about as the beginning of the Catholic charismatic renewal. But there's more to the story. There's more to the story. We're going to go back a bit. We're going to go back a bit. And when most people think about going back a bit, they'll go back maybe as far as Pope Leo the Thirteenth. Who's heard of Pope Leo the Thirteenth, right? Okay, when you think of Pope Leo the Thirteenth, what do you think of? Everybody, on the count of three, Attorney Patrice, right? Yeah, what? That was his encyclical saying: Thomas Aquinas is the man, right? Okay, that's not it. No, Rerum Novarum, right? That was his document on the social encyclical on uh, the importance of the dignity of labor, right? Those are two things he did. He actually was the Pope who wrote the most on the rosary. Did you know that? He wrote like seven encyclicals on the rosary. Yes. He was also the first Pope to be filmed and voice recorded. Not at the same time, though. Let's go. I didn't know that. <laughs> Thank you. Come on up, finish the talk. This is awesome. <laughs> I did not know that. I love that. Uh, he was like late 1800s. Exactly. He was the late 1800s into the early 1900s. Yeah. Uh, so, so here we have Pope Leo uh, the 13th. Now, some of you might have heard of the Saint Michael, the Archangel prayer, right? That's probably where he's most famous. And because of what? He's at mass and all of a sudden he freezes in the midst of celebrating mass. And everyone's like, okay, is he okay? What's going on? And he ends up finishing mass. And after mass, he goes over to a side table and he writes down something. It's the Saint Michael, the Archangel prayer. Saint Michael, the Archangel defend us in battle. And they end up coming around saying, what happened? And he said, while he was celebrating Mass, he was frozen by voices that he heard, that he identified as being the Lord Jesus and the devil. And the devil was saying to Jesus, give me the 20th century and I'll destroy the church. Give me the 20th century and I'll destroy the church. And Jesus said, I give you the 20th century, but I'm going to pour my spirit upon my people. I'm going to pour out my Holy Spirit upon the church. So, uh, so that was the event. And when most people think about how is this connected to um, his life, they think of the St. Michael prayer. But they're missing the rest of the story. And the rest of the story involves a little nun from Lucca, Italy. So think near the uh, Leaning Tower of Pisa, okay? Uh, this little sister, this little nun, who was about 50 years old, she started a religious community, the Oblates of the Holy Spirit. 
She had a tremendous personal devotion to the Holy Spirit. She started getting this, this inspiration that she needed to tell the Pope that the Lord was not happy because he wasn't fostering devotion to the Holy Spirit. He needed to talk more about the Holy Spirit. So she wrote a letter, and another letter, and another letter. And then she went and visited. Hey, you gotta talk about the Holy Spirit. And kind of like that importunate widow that kept bugging Jesus, the bugging, the, the, you know, okay, okay, I'll side for you. The Pope's like, okay, okay, I'll talk about the Holy Spirit. So on a Wednesday audience, he spoke about the Holy Spirit. Whew, done. Did my job. Okay. Uh, he says, okay, I checked that box. No, Sister uh, Elena Guerra, you didn't do enough. Go tell him. Another letter, another letter, another letter. Okay. He, he says, okay, okay, okay. So he ends up writing a document about the importance of the devotion to the Holy Spirit. Okay. I finally get enough done. No, you haven't done enough. 12 letters get to the Pope from this sister. This little nun. He's like, okay, fine, I'm done. I'm gonna write an encyclical. Number one, top level. This is like the top kind of document a Pope writes is an encyclical called uh, Divinum uh, Illud Munus. Uh, it was on the Holy Spirit. And um, I'll just say any Latin words and you'll nod and smile and try to write them down, so. Um, and in it, do you know what the Pope says? He says, I command that every Catholic church from this year forward has a novena to the Holy Spirit from Ascension Thursday to Pentecost Sunday every year from this point forward. Every church in the whole world, none are exempt, all are required, every church a novena to the Holy Spirit to cry out and to beg for the Holy Spirit to be poured upon their community. Now you know that because you've attended novenas to the Holy Spirit at your parish every year for decades. What happened? What happened? What happened was bishops ignored him. They ignored him. But there's more. So the bishops ignored him. This is in 1895. Bishops ignored him. Here comes Sister Elena again. Hey, you have got to dedicate the entire 20th century to the Holy Spirit. You have got to call down the Holy Spirit on the entire 20th century. He's like, got it. December 31st, the year 2000, Midnight Mass, he celebrates Mass at St. Peter's Basilica, and they sing the Veni Creator Spiritus, Come Holy Spirit. And he calls the Holy Spirit down upon all Christians, upon the Catholic Church and upon all Christians on December 31st in the year 1900, January 1st, 1901, the next day, hours later, in a little church house, a schoolhouse, in Topeka, Kansas, this little girl has the Holy Spirit fall on her, and she starts to speak in tongues. Isn't that amazing? You have all of this stuff leading up to the Pope calling for the Holy Spirit to land on the Catholic Church and Christians. And God is like, you know, bishops, you don't do these novenas, you're not going to... I'll find a little girl in Topeka, Kansas that'll be open to receive what I'm going to give. She responded. It caused a revival in Topeka, Kansas in 2001. A few years later, Azusa Street in... So what was I saying, 2001? I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. 1901, remember I said 2000, I mean 19. 1901, 1901, 1901. Five years later, 1906, Azusa Street Revival in LA. They experience a revival. And then you can see this history of revival outbreaks of the Holy Spirit landing on different churches, leading to different levels of renewal, 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 through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the gifts of the Holy Spirit coming alive. 
And then we reach the 1960s. In the 1960s, we have the Second Vatican Council. Bishops of the world come together, and they put together 16 documents. One of their documents is on the church, called Lumen Gentium. This is one of the most important documents. And they have these debates over what should be said, right? And sometimes it's just simple wording. Sometimes it's very meaningful decisions about what's actually the church teaching. So there's a section in there that is talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gifts and charisms that God has given to the church. And it emphasizes, and one version of the document emphasizes the hierarchical gifts, the gifts given through the institution and to bishops, priests, deacons, so the sacraments, institutional gifts, all of that. The question was, do we include gifts given, charisms given, throughout the body of Christ, not through the institution, but in a way that cooperates, corresponds, and resonates with the work that God is doing in the institutional church. Not apart from, not in a competition with, but in a way that will foster as well God's work among his people. The bishops said yes. The Holy Spirit is still at work giving gifts among his people. And we ought to expect those gifts to be operative. December 8th, 1965, that ends. A year and two months later, February 67, January 67, they are in Duquesne uh, University at that retreat. Holy Spirit falls. And since then, 1967, going all the way to today, the Catholic Charismatic Renewal has impacted more than 170 million Catholics around the world. That's almost 20% of the Catholic world has been impacted by the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. Not to mention the hundreds of millions of Christians that have also experienced this awakening of the gift of the Spirit, this release of the power and the giftings of the Holy Spirit. And so one of the reasons we're here, Carrie and I individually and together and here tonight, is because of the way that the Catholic Charismatic Renewal has touched our lives. Each of us in our own journey experienced a a revival, an awakening, a deepening, a renewal of our faith through the gift that the Catholic Charismatic Renewal was there to bring, which is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Right? We are not going to go into the details of this week about what's the theology of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's for next week. Okay? That's it. So you'll have to come back. You'll have to come back. However, that gift, as we've already talked about it, is what Aquinas described as revivescence, reviving gifts and graces already given, but not yet fully yielded to. We've received gifts and graces that we haven't said yes to. Lord, you come and move. Remember, movement means that we get moved. And so why are we here? We are here to say, Lord, move us. Move in us and upon us in ways that go beyond what we've experienced before. Come, fill us to overflowing. I dare you, make it too much. Right? And Lord, bring those gifts and graces because it's through the gifts of the Spirit that we're going to sense what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. So that's why I'm saying to you, hey, get a sense of, like, what's the Lord saying to you? What I'm trying to do there is what Aquinas says. He's like, you have a personal relationship with Jesus. You can read the scriptures, and you can get a sense of nearness to him. You receive Holy Communion. You get a sense of nearness to him. How do you sense a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit? Aquinas says, through the gifts. The gifts of the Spirit are those places of intimate contact by which the Holy Spirit begins to touch your life, touch your heart, and not just touch your heart, but begin to move through you to do the work of God that goes beyond maybe what we've ever imagined, right? You might be cutting your neighbor's grass. You might be praying over the other neighbor who has cancer. You don't know, but are you ready? Are you excited? This is a different brand of Catholicism. This is not typical like what we expect day to day. This sense of wake up because the Holy Spirit has a day in store for you. Let's go. 
All right, Holy Spirit, I want to catch into your movement. My last word for tonight, and that is um, the church is in a hard time. Take a look at, we're in a, what I call a demographic Titanic. Just to, you take a look at the numbers of the church. Here's the sad reality. I'll go to mass. Uh, when I go to daily mass at certain churches, I'm the youngest person there. Right? You don't laugh too loud. Oh, when Carrie's with me, she's the youngest person. When I see Barbie, she's the youngest person. When I see John, I'm the youngest person. So. Sorry, John doesn't get the microphone. That's hard for him, man. That is hard. Okay, so um, we're in a time where the demographics are terrible. And the pain and the loss of faith in the next generation is terrible. God is not going to sit idly by in the sidelines. No, God's going to move. No, God is moving. And the question is, are we going to move with God or are we going to miss? I'm here because I don't want to miss out. We can't do everything. We can't save the whole world, but we can do our part. We can do our part. And we can say, Holy Spirit, come. Come with power. Come with an anointing. Come with a gifting. Come and release within us gifts and graces that we have no clue what it is you want to do. Preserve us from gang wars. Yes. <laughs> Preserve us from that. But Lord, other than that, bring signs and wonders, healings, expectant faith, evangelization, sharing faith. Heal us and heal others through us. Who wants that? I mean, that's the living God, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. So honestly, Carrie and I didn't think when we came here that this was going to be a big part of our ministry, um, a charismatic prayer meeting. But we're not in charge, right? We're not in charge. She's in charge. So <laughs> did I say that right there? Yes, I said that right there. Yeah. The Lord's in charge. And so what we want to do is be docile. Okay. So. What we're gonna do next week is we're gonna learn about the gift of baptism in the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. And then in the next week after that, we're gonna pray for a deeper release of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So next week we'll, have, we'll give you a prayer that you can pray in preparation. But in the meantime, along the way, if this is stirring something in you, please, please take it to the Lord. Pray, ask the Lord, say, Lord, I want it now. I don't want to wait two weeks. Right now, tonight, let's go, bring it on, right? Because we don't want to hold back what God's timing is for things. At the same time, we also know that the Lord honors this idea of getting ready, getting ready, preparing the way. So we'll talk more about that next week, okay? Um, We are going to, we'll have a closing song. We'll have a closing song and there will be prayer teams. So there are folks in the room who have already experienced this baptism of the Holy Spirit, already have discerned and been trained to pray with others with expectant faith for healing. And so in the front room back there, um, Debbie will be there with a couple of other ladies ready to welcome you if you would want to be prayed with. Now, you could be prayed with for, you know what, I just am, I'm burdened. Or there's something happening in my family's life. Or I'm really struggling with something. Allow the Lord to minister to you through them. That would be a beautiful gift. If you're a man, good luck. So no. <laughs> if you're a man, there'll be some guys downstairs ready to pray with you to receive the same blessings. Okay, so women can be prayed with by the woman. Women, women. Men downstairs can be prayed with by a couple of guys ready to have you there. Okay? So I'm going to say a, a, a prayer, and then I want to give you guys a chance to just share, just again to vocalize, what struck you the most about what you heard? Or do you have any questions about what you heard? I want to just give a, a few minutes for that. What struck you the most about what you heard? Well, what questions do you have? And we'll do it as a, a, a large group rather than small group discussion, okay? All right, let me just close with a prayer and then we'll do that dis- uh, discussion. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord our God, I thank you and praise you for the gift of life, the gift of the movements that your Holy Spirit has brought about in the history of the church. And Lord, we recognize the challenges of being alive in this moment. And Lord, we just want to honor you by saying yes. Thank you for planting us in this moment. Make us the saints that you 
intend us to be and give us the graces and the giftings to be open to fulfill the mission that is ours. Lord, we ask that you would overwhelm us and go far beyond what we imagine in how you bless us in this group tonight and in the weeks to come. And Lord, just continue to extend and expand this in accord with your vision, your purposes, your will for this group and others like it happening around the world. Lord, to continue to just raise up hungry hearts ready to receive you and ready to move in accord with your will. And we make this prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, any questions or comment? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Jerry. Right. So, in what ways did the church experience this destruction that if Jesus did entrust the 20th century to the devil, what would that look like? So, Pope, um, Pope St. Pius XII said that um, decay in the church is marked by a decay in dogma, morals, and liturgy. So if we want to take a look at how has the church experienced a sense of decay, erosion, look at dogma. So it's not that complicated if we take a look at, for instance, one of the very central beliefs is Christ is truly present in the Eucharist, as Eucharist, and yet we've had so many people lose their Catholic faith, and those that self-identify as Catholic, only 30%, of self-identifying Catholics believe that Jesus is truly present as Eucharist. What do they believe, right? So we can see a decay in dogma and doctrines matter, ideas matter, right? They, they determine how it is we see the world and how we live our lives. Yeah, so Lucy makes a great point. When we think about Carrie and I parenting our kids, how do we help elevate their sense of faith that belief in God is fundamental to living well we draw attention to the supernatural. How do you get your kids to be torn away from uh, being grounded in the, the here and now, which is so heavy, it's so heavy. And the answer is lift them up to the realm of the supernatural, the miraculous. Yeah. So um, Kerry actually likes bringing in, uh, let's bring in the exorcisms of the people who died and, and went to hell and got rescued out, because it's like, it's a battle. By the way, Sister Elena Guerra, do you know what the word Guerra means in Italian? It means war. Oh, it means wow. war. That God chose the right woman, right? <laughs> this is a battle, baby. Let's go. So um, I tend to like the apparitions of our Blessed Mother, right? So the Tilma, uh, Lady of Lords. So many beautiful miracles that are, are Eucharistic miracles, right? So we found all our like, favorite YouTube videos to show them explanations of these, like the Holy House of Loretto. You ever hear about like, go look up that, you'll be blown away. Like, how do you explain that, right? So evidence of the supernatural is a way of helping to pull kids out of the purely natural. You're talking about- Oh, sorry, dogma, morals, and we're a completely immoral country, so that's not even an Look at the loss, right? Look at the losses and what's at stake, right? What's the, what's the meaning of sexual identity? What's the meaning of marriage? What's the meaning of the beginning of life and the end of life? What's family? I mean, the devil, right? The devil, the, the greatest attack of the devil is going to be against the family, Sister Lucia, right? From the visionary of Fatima. But in the Catholic, since we're the Catholic faith, we're, most of our strength is coming from our sacraments. So focusing on the sacrament of reconciliation, what can happen there? What what are the healings that are happening there? And people think about it like, oh, I don't want to go, you know. Yet when you go to con a confession, there might be something that the priest is endowed with that will help you move to that next level, yes. so that you're not struggling with a particular, mm -hmm. or maybe you'll have a healing or something. Yeah. Absolutely, right? And that's, let's call that the third one, liturgy, right? So under liturgy, you could call all the sacraments, and boy, has the sacrament of confession, sacrament of penance and reconciliation, has that advanced and grown through the 20th century? Or was there a great swindle? The great swindle where Catholics freely gave up going to confession mm -hmm. in exchange for general absolution, in exchange for uh, a, a wiping out of the concept of sin, a wiping out of the need for confession. What a robbery. Yeah. How did that happen? Yeah, so I know, well, why did it happen, right? Is, is, 
And so I would say this, that there was the underlying current in the culture that was stronger than the culture coming from our Catholic faith. We've lost the culture war, if you will, the culture of death when it comes to understanding our life versus a Catholic way of looking at faith and life, we have lost battle after battle. And so then the same thing in liturgy. If you want to kill reverence, if you want to kill reverence in the liturgy, make it casual. Right? A casual liturgy is not a liturgy that will foster a sense of I'm in the presence of an all holy God whom I'm here to worship. Right? So all right, Michelle was next. Well, I just wanted to say, like you said, like what struck you, and it was um, when you said that um, like he would bring down his spirit on his people. And that, I just wonder if this is accurate. I feel like that's more the laity this time versus the priests and the religious sisters, that it's the laity's more guide and responsibility to build that church back up. It's, you know, it's, um, yeah. especially as we see our numbers dwindling in those areas um, as more and more people are choosing uh, family life versus a religious vocation. Is how do we as a laity then build that back out and spread the word instead of the, the religious. It's a great point. Yeah, it's a point that uh, I intended to make about this movement. Thank you, Michelle. Very inspired there. Uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen. Uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, he said this was going to be the age of the lady in the 70s. He said, don't look to the bishops, don't look to the priests, look to the lady. You're the ones that are going to be salt, light, and leaven in this world. And so if you look at historically, what happened in the church in terms of the charisms, I'm going a little far afield here, but maybe you'll find this interesting. So in the time of the New Testament and in the early church, there was a great expectation of signs and wonders and deeds of power. So that would accompany the preaching of the gospel. It wasn't a shocking thing to see people casting out demons and, and, and people experiencing tremendous healings. But as time went on in the church and the rise of the sacraments happened and the church became a bit more, if you will, institutionalized, the miracles of grace became more associated with two things, the sacraments and saints. So sacraments are places where miracles happen. You see a miracle every single time you go to mass, right? You see a supernatural work occur. But then when you take a look at where the signs and wonders happen, it gets associated with those who are extremely holy, saints. In fact, that becomes one of the signs that they are, in fact, saints, right? The sign of them advancing on the path to be canonized as a saint is a miracle that they performed when they were alive and then a miracle they performed after they died through their intercession. But we're all called to be saints. That's right. Hey, hold on. Hold on here. <laughs> Don't get radical on me here. Come on now. So what do we end up have happening? Coming from the Second Vatican Council, there's a recovery... There's a renewing of the sense that, no, God heals not only through specially anointed ones, but through all who are, guess what, specially anointed. So since we're all anointed, then we all should have this sense of openness and expectancy that those gifts of the Spirit are going to be stirred, are going to be lavished and given. And in fact, he'll use his people to minister healing, not just, oh, here comes the healer in town. Now the healer leaves town and healings go with him or her. No, it's God's people. And remember, so remember the term the body of Christ. That's yes. Right. And why did he give each person gifts and not always the same? Because he wanted everybody to come together and help each other. Yep. That's right. Well, and, and I think this again, we can go all, uh, there's a lot to say here. If you're uh, sick, you can fill in. <laughs> come on, Lucy, let's go. So no, no, this is great. So in a time that's called Christendom, where the church has a seat at the table, the church is a respected voice and has embedded itself in, in society, the idea of signs and wonders diminishes in terms of its need because, well, the culture around you, leave it to beaver, is a bit healthier. But in a post-Christian, post theistic time where people now, even in America, grow up saying, I don't, I've never heard about Jesus. I, I don't know who Jesus is. I've never been to church. You, or people who've said, oh yeah, yeah, I grew up, I know all of that. I've already mastered all that information that was forced on me as a kid. 
They haven't had that encounter with Christ. So is it surprising that we would have an emergence of a new age of signs and wonders and deeds of power? That that's going to be what gives a fresh new look at something that people thought they already had mastered and controlled. So I, I don't know that for sure, but that's my sense. My sense is that God, that is what God is doing, not what we're deciding or thinking, this is a good strategy, God, you should think about it, <laughs> right? No, this is what God is doing. So, Asa. Amen, Asa, that is awesome. So Asa is saying about at Christmas time, we have the three kings visiting and the baby Jesus in Bethlehem. He's born there in a stable and look, the kings there, they want to go find Jesus. And they end up finding Jesus and they bring their gifts to baby Jesus. We get to bring our gifts to baby Jesus. And we do that at mass with the bread and wine and it becomes Jesus. And then we join with Christ on the cross there to proclaim Christ and the salvation that he won for us. I love it, Asa. It's a good word, good word. Woo, let's go. Wise men and shepherds, sorry. Oh man, I'm gonna correct you here. All right, I got it. I'm faithful, graceful, and grateful. I love it. Let's go. Let's go. You're, you're the man, Asa. All right, next week we got Lucy and Asa giving the teaching. This is good. All right. Kimberly, go. Yeah, have, have movements ever gone astray? Have movements ever been heretical? Have movements ever started on the right path, ended on the wrong path? The answer is absolutely every age. In every age, you can see folks that pop up they recognize a weakness in the church or in the world. They propose, ooh, I've been specially anointed by God, right? They might get up there and start talking about the neighbor cutting the grass and all that. <laughs> Watch out, flee the building, making up stories about drugs and stuff like that. So um, absolutely, there's a need to discern. And so one of the ways of discerning is saying, is the institution bishops, priests, deacons, are they open to what the Holy Spirit is doing apart from their specific governance and direction? But those that are feeling drawn and moved by the Spirit, are they threatened by or are they seeking to remain under, properly associated with, the church that Christ has instituted? So where you see conflict in history is where you have those that are, let's call it charismatically graced, graced in special ways, attempting to relate to the church and not finding a reception, or not interested in finding validation by the institutional church. So there are all kinds of you know, signs that you could take a look at, but that's just a general way of saying it, is how do they relate to the, to the church in their time? Were they um, obedient? Were they submissive? Were they docile? Um, and yet, did they also attempt to fulfill their call? So that's really where the big challenge is. Okay, sure. yes. Hi, I'm Emily. Um, so, I have a question. So, okay, a fact. So I hung up brand new Catholic, like three years, right? We can tell. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> You didn't give the special handshake on the way in, so we knew. So we knew. This is the totally out of my comfort zone, charismatic. I had to Google that, right? <laughs> um, and I'm a very logical person. I like to know what I'm supposed to do, where I'm supposed to go, how I'm supposed to do the center of the cross. I just like stuff like that. I'm not a very outside of the box sort of I like linear lines, right? So this is my like, right? <laughs> so I mean, I like the song. I'm not trying to be like super offensive. I'm trying to ask a question. So, like, I like the songs, right? And singing, and that's cool. But what I don't understand is the speaking in the tongues. Do I have to? Yeah. Uh, only if you right want to be now, saved. Right only now. if you want to be saved. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, hell is an option. I mean, you know, it's up to you. Can so. I be part of your whole group and sing songs? And okay, everybody, don't let her leave the room. Don't let her leave the room. I play rugby. I know. <laughs> 
the baby. You got the baby. Let's go. Yeah. So, oh, it's so good. Emily, so, uh, I hey. Just like you. Right. Yeah, Lucy, yeah, Emily, I'm so glad that you said that because you're literally the only person in the room who's thinking that. Yeah. No, like half of the people here are like, I'm with her, and I'm glad she said it. Because I've never been there, never done that. What is this thing all about? And I thought Tom was kind of solid. What's he doing here? Yeah, totally. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. 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 He's doing yeah. 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 there, right? Yeah. Right? So that's kind of like a, whoa. And so um, we're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit next week. But here's, here's the concept of speaking in tongues, right? It's referenced in the New Testament, right? Um, what is that gift? It's really about what does it mean to yield to the Holy Spirit, right? So our whole life of faith is all about the Holy Spirit is in me, and I'm going to give the first place, Holy Spirit, move me. Move me to say this or don't say this, do this or don't do this, move my thoughts, right? So all of a sudden, I've got the person of God in me that is wanting to move me and move through my life. Right? In, in terms of how I shape my life, how I live my life. Does that make sense so far? Right? I got to think about that. Okay. So, um, read all the great spiritual writers in our tradition. Introduction to the Devout Life. Imitation of Christ. Right? <laughs> Are you tracking over here? St. Francis de Sales. Why are you laughing? I don't understand why you're laughing. Oh, sorry. If you read the great spiritual classics, they will summarize the entire life of discipleship in two words. You know what those two words are? Discern and obey. Listen and follow. Well, discern what? Listen to who? And do what? Well, take a look at the Acts of the Apostles, and you'll see they spend their entire time doing what? Discerning, listening. What's the Holy Spirit want us to do now? Are we supposed to go there or stay here? Are we supposed to address that situation or walk away from that situation? So it's all about the reality of the Holy Spirit, the third person to the Trinity, alive in our hearts. That Holy Spirit, we have living contact and communication with. That's just being a disciple. So being a disciple, to speak in a linear fashion, is not just a matter of saying, a disciple believes these things, so I accept those statements as true. A disciple of Jesus follows this moral code, so I will do that. And a disciple, a Catholic Christian disciple of Jesus, follows this ritual set of, um, of practices, mass and sacraments, and, and okay, I'll go do those things too. So if I believe those statements, follow these rules to the best I can, and I attend these spiritual practices, am I being... A disciple of Jesus. Yeah. Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict would say, no. Ooh. <laughs> he says that if all we do in our life of faith is believe the statements, follow the rules, and obey those commands, we'll experience faith as a heavy burden. Yes. He says the heart of faith is in the heart. The heart where the Lord approaches us, speaks to us, and touches our hearts every day. And guess what's going to happen if we open our lives and we have this sense of saying, wow, religion is a relationship with the Lord. That the living God is going to come close to me and actually move in me, touch my heart, experience his love. Guess what I'm going to do? Believe these things, follow these rules, and go under these things. But it's a different thing. It's a different thing because doing those things is called Phariseeism. Yes. Right? It's external observance of yes. beliefs, moral law, and practices. Jesus wants the heart. Jesus is in the heart. And if, we, if he gets our heart, guess what he's also going to get? He's going to get us to want to know him better, believes. He's going to want to get us to live in accord with his moral law. I'm going to follow the way. And we're going to encounter him in all those spiritual uh, practices called the sacraments. Okay, So it's a matter of those 
That whole reality, okay, now, how does that whole reality come alive in us? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit given to us in baptism. And so the sacraments communicate the very life of God. It's the very reality of God in us, the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that Holy Spirit in us, we now have to come into contact with, okay, Holy Spirit, how do I know that that's you and not lunch? Okay? <laughs> and that's what discernment is. You look at all the manuals on discernment and it's discerning, is that me, is that the devil, or is that God? And so I have to figure out that little prompting, that little nudge. Did you ever get a little nudge that said, you should call that person, just say yes. Yes. <laughs> so, I, you know, I should probably go to that prayer meeting tonight. A little nudge, a little nudge. And then you're saying, is that from me or not? So that's the life of the spirit. The life of the spirit is sensing, distinguishing, discerning, and then following what I've heard. Okay. Boy, that was the longest wind-up for... Oh, no, 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 I didn't talk to you yet. Okay, now. I, the question was speaking in tongues. Okay. <laughs> Woo, what a wind-up. Okay, here comes the pitch. Here comes the pitch. Here's the pitch. No, 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 no. Is it easier to do that when you're in sin grace? Or when you have an attachment to sin? Oh, oh uh, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Hold on. Because people, it's, it's easier to hear the Holy Spirit those right. choices, just to be holy. Absolutely. Absolutely. When we're in that state of grace, we'll have that sense of openness to God. But I want to address the specific question, speak in tongues. What I'm doing, if I'm praying, and that gift of speaking in tongues is happening, is I've yielded my very moment of prayer to the Holy Spirit. So instead of me saying, you know, I'm a pretty articulate guy, Lord, Lord, I praise you for your wonder, the wonders of your creation, especially the glories and the mountains. And Lord, I thank you for the way that I can be articulate, but what am I doing when I'm articulate? I'm using my brain, I'm thinking about it. What do I want to access? How do I want to vocalize that? How am I going to let that flow out? And I can become really good at that. But what's easy to have happen when I am praying in a way where I'm using strongly my own interior capabilities. What might get in the way is me. So what speaking in tongues does is, Lord, I'm taking a seat. I'm gonna set aside for the moment my intellectual thinking about what I ought to be praying. And I'm gonna say, Holy Spirit, you are alive in me. You activate the prayer that you would have me pray right now. I may not understand it. It may sound like gibberish to those around me, but I'm yielding my lips to you. And that's what happens. And so that's the gift of speaking in tongues. Simply put, wait till you hear the complicated. <laughs> so I don't know if that was helpful to say yes anyways. Yes, thank you. I put a lot of effort into that. All right. Um, and now we have to, we have to stop. Yeah, yeah, here, Chris. All right. Now we have to, yeah, stop. Okay, we're going to close in prayer, fellowship, prayer in the front room, prayer downstairs, women, men.